Good morning, everyone. Uh, so to those of you who are here in person and uh, online, uh, welcome to you. Welcome to our distinguished uh, panelists uh, and moderator. I'm Gloria Gajali. I'm the director of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, and also an associate professor at the University of Geneva. And I'm really, truly thrilled uh, to, to be able, uh, as part of the Geneva Academy, to host this event, a very important event, uh, because it's a celebration. And it's a celebration of a huge accomplishment. Uh, it's a celebration of a book and the launch of a book, and not any book. It's the commentary and the second edition of the commentary of the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and its Optional Protocol. Uh, so this book has been edited uh, by Patricia Schultz, uh, who is the moderator in this event. I'm going to introduce her uh, later. Um, it has also been co-edited by Ruth Halperin Kadari, Beat Rudolph, and both of them are with us today. So welcome and also by Marsha uh, A. Freeman. So not only you have four incredible co-editors who really know what they are talking about, but in addition to that, you have 28 experts, practitioners, and scholars who have participated in this endeavor and written uh, the commentaries to, to the articles of the convention and this optional protocol. So I will show you the book because then you, you realize what it means. Oh, that. Isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful and full of substance. So what are you going to learn when you read that book? You are going to get to know more uh, about the jurisprudence of the CEDO committee over the last 10 years. You are going to have a better grasp of the current challenges uh, in relation to human rights and gender equality. You are going also to see what important role the CEDO has played in pushing the envelope, in making sure that the CEDO conventions remains uh, relevant today and tackles the current challenges we are facing. So I'm convinced uh, that this book uh, will be really one of the major work uh, on the CEDO convention and that it will be useful for practitioners, for academics, scholars, but also for students. Uh, and so as a director of an academic institution, I can see how students are really interested in those topics. Uh, recently, I received the, the choices from our students from the LLM uh, program in International Humanitarian and Human Rights and from the Master in Transitional Justice regarding the themes they would like to discuss for their uh, master's uh, thesis. And I was struck by the number of students who selected topics that were related to women's rights and gender rights. So you can be sure that uh, this book will be very much used at the Geneva Academy. So to discuss this book, we have uh, an amazing panel. I'm not going to introduce each panelist. Patricia Schultz is going to do so, but I'm going to introduce a moderator. So Patricia Schultz is a former CEDO committee member and rapporteur. And she's also senior research associate at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. So welcome and enjoy this panel. Thank you very much, Gloria. It's really been a joy collaborating with uh, uh, your academy to organize this uh, panel and to organize the launch of the commentary. I mean, 
For us, it has been a long process, and we're so glad to be able to present the result of our long conversation with the authors um, today. Um, the introductions I will make to the panelists will be minimum due to time constraints. And if you want more about their CVs, please look for further information on the internet. Um, I ask the panelists to present in seven or eight minutes the most fascinating or challenging aspects of their respective chapters. So you will have in a nutshell what others will have to discover reading the whole chapters. I will follow the alphabetic order of panelists as by chance it makes sense in regard with the content of the chapters the panelists authored or co-authored. So we will start with the presentation by Professor Andrew Burns, who will guide us through the first two articles of the convention on the definition and on the core definition of discrimination and core obligations of state parties. Andrew, you have the floor. Thank you uh, very much, Patricia. Uh, can I just confirm that you're hearing me okay in the room? We can't. So you can? Okay. All right, thank, thanks very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to participate in this event today from 16,000 kilometers and many time zones away, although I'd rather be there. And I'd like to thank the organizers and the Geneva Academy for making it possible. I'm joining you today from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, one of the first nations on the continent of Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I've been fortunate enough to have been involved in both editions of the commentary and in four chapters in each case, articles one, two, 23 and 24. And I'd like to thank all the editors for that opportunity and for their work, and also Karin Jank of the German Institute for Human Rights for her work as well. And of course, I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors in the second edition with whom I've very much enjoyed working. Dr. Megan Campbell of the University of Birmingham, Associate Professor Pooja Kapaya of the University of Hong Kong, and Dr. Dora Anthony of the University of Wollongong, who I see is on the call. Uh, my comments today, of course, are my own. Uh, my co-authors may well have different views or emphases. I'd also like to pay tribute to a number of women who have encouraged and supported my work on the convention and the committee over many years, indeed, over 30 years. They include Elizabeth Evatt, Avon Fraser, the late Avon Fraser, Rebecca Cook, Savatri Gunasekara, and especially Shanti Dairiam and her colleagues at Eero Asia Pacific. As I'm sure some of you know, three of these inspiring women have also served as members of the CEDAW committee. My time is limited, and so I just uh, commend to you the chapters on Article 23, the savings provision, and on the orphan Article 24, uh, which is a substantive obligation placed rather awkwardly in the structural part of the convention. Those articles have received very little attention in the practice of the committee, but certainly the chapters are worth reading. In contrast, Articles 1 and 2 are, of course, fundamental to the Convention's framework and have a distributive operation over many other articles. My comments touch on a few elements of recent practice under each provision and their treatment in the new edition of the commentary. I focus on developments that present new issues or old, old issues given new prominence. It's not a comprehensive engagement with the practice over the last decade, let alone with the practice of the last 40 years. And focus on the new shouldn't distract from the continuity of the committee's work on so many fundamental issues. The chapter on Article 1 has increased in size from 20 to 28 pages, while that on Article 2 has grown from 29 to 36. This isn't just the result of there being two authors instead of one, but reflects the new issues and more sustained attention to some existing ones. Let me mention two issues under Article 1. The first is that of intersectionality. This has long been a critical element of the committee's analysis, but in the last decade or so, it seems to have received even more concentrated attention. The committee has ranged widely across personal and group characteristics and social and economic statuses to identify and address the particular forms of intersectional discrimination that diverse groups of women face. In general recommendation 35 from 2017 on gender-based violence against women, the committee lists by my count, some 37 different statuses of potential intersectional discrimination. And the list is not exhausting. 
Holding together this range of diversity within the framework of a single convention on discrimination against women is a challenge and the committee's achievement in this regard should be acknowledged. The second related issue that assumes a more prominent place in the second edition of the commentary than in the first is that of sexual orientation and gender identity. These are issues that have given rise to enormous controversy in many countries. The committee has sought to recognize a range of violations perpetrated on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, and has brought many of them within the framework of a convention that is largely premised on a binary view of sex and gender. The committee has achieved this by a consistent focus on the ways in which ascribed status and stereotypes based on gender have denied individuals justice. It has also regularly called out egregious violations of rights by reference to gender identity or sexual orientation. In a treaty drafted when apparently the concept of women was seen as definitionally unproblematic, this is a demonstration of the dynamic interpretation and application of a human rights treaty to new issues or to older issues newly perceived. Let me then turn to Article 2. Supplemented by Articles 3 and 24, this is the core provision that sets out the general obligations of states' parties. I'd like to highlight three areas of development. The first is in relation to the distinction between the responsibility of states' parties for their own actions and those of their officials, and their responsibility in relation to the actions of private actors, the latter often referred to as the obligation of due diligence. Both types of obligations are covered by the Convention, and the coverage of private actors is critical to the achievement of the Treaty's goals. At times over the years, there has been a conflation of the two categories, and the committee and others have not always been consistent in their use of terminology. However, in General Recommendation 35, the committee clearly and authoritatively distinguished between the two obligations. This distinction matters because the obligation on the state in relation to its own actions is more stringent than that in relation to private actors. It's more than just due diligence. However, at the same time, one must say the committee has adopted a demanding standard of states' parties under the due diligence obligation, in particular in its case law relating to violence. The second issue is the so-called extraterritorial operation of the convention, in particular the application of the convention to acts or omissions by the state party in its own territory that have external effects, in particular an adverse effect on the level of human rights enjoyed by women in the territory of another state. The convention contains no territorial application provision, yet consistent with other developments in the human rights field, the committee has adopted an expansive approach in relation to the externalized effect of a state's actions or the actions of private individuals or corporations over whom it has jurisdiction or legal control. This expansion has been seen both in concluding observations of general recommendations. One interesting example is in the field of tax justice where the committee has reminded states which operate tax havens of their responsibility for the adverse impact that such systems can have on the ability of other states to have sufficient resources for the realization of women's rights. The committee has also added its voice to calls for states to take a more active role in regulating the activities of their private corporations abroad that adversely affect women's human rights. Finally, Article 2 has been a major hook on which the committee has engaged with existential issues such as climate change, disasters and conflict, with important general recommendations on these themes in the last decade. In each case, the committee has affirmed states' obligations internally and externally, and has engaged with other international law regimes, climate law, disaster law, including pandemics and recovery from them, and international humanitarian law, among others. Sometimes the direct connection with the, connection, with the convention's specific articles is vaguely or loosely articulated, but there is no doubt that the convention does and should have something to say about these threats that are indeed existential to the lives and livelihoods of women and girls, indeed, the lives of everyone on this planet and of future generations. Over its 40 years of work, the committee has not shrunk from taking on controversial and challenging issues to alleviate and dismantle structures of gender oppression. It's been determined and creative in how it's gone about doing that. I'm sure it will continue to do so and that the next edition of the commentary, whenever it appears, will be even longer and richer than the last two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your presentation. I think we have really the, the framework 
of <coughs> our discussion. And um, I really enjoyed your recognizing the guts of the committee. And in this room, I am pleased to say that we have former members um, who are also former chairs of the committee and under whose guidance the committee moved into pioneering work. So now we are going to turn to the presentation by Professor Ruth Halperan Kadari, who will speak on Article 16. This article is closely linked to the first two articles, <laughs> as marriage and family law is of, wrong, often represents a main ground of discrimination against women and inequality of women and girls. And it crosses over to other fields of law, such as tax or social law. So Ruth, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for coming. This is a very joyous occasion for, for all of us, uh, particularly to us editors. It's a combination of uh, four years of uh, work, and I want to pay particular gratitude to Patricia for taking the lead and the largest role in the editorial work and for bearing with us. And um, without her, I think that we would really not be able to celebrate and to be here today. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the work of uh, Professor Marcia Freeman, who unfortunately could not be with us here today uh, for writing the first um, uh, um, chapter, the first uh, edition of the chapter on Article 16, uh, on whose work I uh, very much relied in, in writing um, this um, edition uh, of, of our Article 16. So working on Article 16 has been a real privilege for me, um, in, 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 almost a, a gift in a sense, because I speak here today not only as the author of Chapter 16, but also as a former CEDAW expert whose work throughout my three years, my three terms on the committee, corresponding with the decade that this commentary follows, actually centered around Article 16. So for me, writing this chapter was like going back in time only now I was wearing the researcher's hat, adopting a reflective and critical perspective. And this is a very unique experience. It's not often that one gets to see things from such different positions, from both sides of the, of the scene, and to engage in what was in fact self-reflection of much of my own work on the committee. So when asked about the challenges that I faced during this exercise of writing the chapter, the first thing that came to my mind recalls the frustration that I often felt during the dialogues in which I participated and was always in charge of Article 16. And the thing is this, since dialogues with states parties, unlike the colloquium here today, are conducted according to the order of the articles and not according to the order of family names, so the issues covered by Article 16 are always addressed at the end of the dialogue, often leaving little time for discussion. Suggestions to change this order and have these issues discussed in the first part of the dialogue, like we're doing today, right after Article 2, were not accepted. In addition, until 20, about 2010, state parties' reports often lacked detailed information on Article 16, and the committee itself could not always offer family law expertise to respond to this deficiency. Therefore, well into the first decade of the 21st century, the committee's record on dealing with family relations and family law was uneven. This unevenness was quite evident to me when approaching the task of evaluating the committee's jurisprudence on Article 16, and that old sense of frustration resurfaced. But the challenge now was how to be able to accurately capture what really happened, how to base my own assessments of the committee's work and all its developments on concrete data. So here comes the researcher's role into play. What I decided to do was to build a database of all the concluding observations on Article 16 that were adopted every other year to break them into issues and subject matters, in fact, 51 subcategories, and to systematically code them so that their patterns and processes could be tracked. Indeed, 
following the concluding observations using this quantitative data reflects the uneven record and the evolutionary process that took place. For instance, in 2008, only two thirds of the concluding observations had actually a paragraph on family relations, but by 2013, they all had one. On the more specific issue of marital property and its distribution, in 2007, only a quarter of the COBs addressed it, but between 2010 to 2015, about half of the concluding observations did so. So this time frame is not coincidental. These were the years during which General Recommendation 29 on the economic consequences of family relations and their dissolution has made its way through the process of discussion, revision, until final approval and adoption by the committee in 2013. Clearly then, the process of adoption of the general recommendation led to an increase in awareness of the centrality of this issue to the goal of equality in family relations. And it is hoped that this awareness continues in the committee's work in the future. On the more qualitative side of the research, what clearly emerges from this big picture is the global double bind in which women find themselves in relation to threats to their rights from both sides of the political map. Namely, authoritarian regimes based on overt patriarchal religious traditions from the global south and liberal regimes purporting to promote egalitarian values from the global north. While they come from opposite directions of the political map, <coughs> as the whole book shows, and as emerges especially strongly from this chapter on Article 16, they may both lead to the same end game against women. Extremists and fundamentalists regimes grow more extreme in their hostility towards women's rights, and liberal regimes delude themselves in having already achieved gender equality and embrace gender neutral laws and policies that ignore persistent inequalities such as continuing pay gaps, gender-based domestic violence, gendered care economy, and more. Both these concerning trends from the opposite directions translate into laws and policies that are far removed from both formal equality as well as substantive equality. This process is particularly evident in the area of family relations, where dozens of states' parties to the convention still maintain formally discriminatory laws. And from the other direction, many state parties see family relations as the area where their gender neutrality ideology should be manifested. To counter this somewhat depressing observation of the developments which are external to the committee, and to conclude on a more optimistic tone, let us shift our gaze back to the work of the committee itself. What this chapter clearly shows on the internal front of the committee's work is an impressive evolutionary process by which the committee expanded its understanding of the issues under Article 6, 16 progressively, breaking new grounds in the areas of the economic consequences of family relations, the connection between domestic violence and questions on child custody, the taxation of married couples, the rights of women living in de facto relationships, and more. By that, the committee not only continued to standard setting on the topic of gender equality in the family, but also served as a counterforce to the regressive processes on the international arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, for this fascinating analysis. And I realized right now that the thrill of this uh, discussion has completely perverted my sense of the alphabetical order. So I apologize <laughs> <laughs> to you, Hilary Benema. You should have had the floor before. <laughs> um, so we will now <laughs> go to your presentations. A principal way to escape discrimination 
And um, inequality is, of course, through education. And this field has been specific, specially hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic with high numbers of girls who will never return to school, never complete their education. Hilary Bedema, as rector of the Law Institute in Accra, you will take us through what education can provide or not, under which conditions, and you have the floor. Thank you very much. And may I begin by thanking you and the editors for this groundbreaking work. I would begin by talking about the process. Please, the microphone. Is it on? It's working. It's on. Yes, it's working. Yes. Closer. And it is indeed a privilege to have worked with such distinguished scholars who were also friends. They were people who in difficult circumstances, we could go behind the scenes and pour out our pity stories and get strength from one another. This backdrop to this work is very essential because there are many of these soft issues, soft quote and unquote, that we do not acknowledge the, the social capital building before we enter into the hard area of academic work. And let me thank my colleagues for having had this platform. So when I was approached, this was a, almost a serendipitous uh, uh, entry into this field. My first sense was one of uh, some amount of inadequacy about the phenomenal task ahead. It's sometimes good that we, we pour our hearts out in, in, in fora like, uh, like this. But then on second thoughts, I thought, why not? And I was particularly <coughs> empowered to have to work with a very distinguished scholar who was also a friend, Professor Bailey, Barbara Bailey. When I entered the committee, she was doing education. My forty then was in violence and health. But then after a few sessions, I realized that education was probably good and for very good reasons. I'll come to that at the end. So the process was a mutually reinforcing one. For us, it was reflective and it was a mutual mentoring process because I think this is probably the only chapter we're talking about here that is co-edited. Article one. Oh, what was also co-edited, no, no, very no. well. No, I mean, right here today, talking about here. Anyway, oh, never today, mind. Yes. yes, today, here, yes, absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. So the co-authorship process is also a unique one. Every Saturday, Professor Bailey and I, unless we had uh, any other appointments, had one hour, in the evening to discuss the work and to discuss issues around education and women's human rights. So that was a very empowering uh, process. And it was also a mirroring process which served us well in this, um, in this endeavor. Now, coming back to the work in front of us, it was also an opportunity to broach taboo subjects subjects that within the committee even did not uh, gain acceptance for discussion or even inclusion in the, in the concluding observations. So this was a space. So first of all, it was a, an opportunity to enter a taboo area and broach such subjects like menstrual hygiene, be more progressive and deliberate about comprehensive sexuality education and then about pregnant girls' re-entry processes. It was an opportunity to take stock of our concluding observations and find that for some of these, we had concluding observations on them. Some went a bit far, but that coherence was missing. And the commentary gave the opportunity to walk through these recommendations and to present them in a co 
coherent fashion. So that was a groundbreaking aspect of the work. Then moving on, <clears throat> even though for many of us, education is fundamental. It has become so fundamental that it is probably taken for granted. Therefore, when we went into working on the issue of education, there was the deliberateness of placing a spotlight on it and reaffirming it as a human right. As I said, in many parts of the world, education is normal. But when you look at some other parts of the world, including mine, it is a choice that families have had to make. Whether to prioritize a girl's education over a boy's and for how long? And for what obstacles would a girl be pulled out of school as against a boy? So it was important for us to affirm that education was not only a human right, but a gateway right that allows girls to access and enjoy other human rights. And education broadens the perspectives of a girl about the role she can play. And this is why it is a gateway right, that she can go into employment, that she can go into public office. And it is a key space, and very often the only space for meeting peers, mentors, and role models. This became very evident during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic when girls could not go to school. And it opened new spaces for girls to act in, reach out, and to influence others. One unique fact about education is that once it is gained, it is one right that you can never lose. You can lose the right to vote, you can lose the right to work, but once the education is within you, the ways it manifests, I never be taken away from it. And so um, it was therefore important for us in propounding education to look at the ways in which this would resonate in the commentary and with users of the commentary. We were careful to state that Apart from the developmental dividends of education, education should be seen as a standalone right and not as a right that should be given only because it can open out as a gateway right. And we tried to do this, or we, we believed we achieved this through looking, again, drawing from our general recommendation 35 on, in particular, rights within education. We looked at rights to education and affirmed that now we need to go beyond parity and look at the experience of girls within the educational sector. Violence, the learning process, the classroom experience, the exclusion, the discrimination, and that because all these experiences in education determine how much traction is gained from it. So this is a point in which this is an aspect that we looked at when we looked at the rights within education. It was also important to look at rights through education. And this speaks to the currency of certification in how much it reflects in the world of employment. We dealt with this in the, in the commentary. But permit me to share one or two thoughts that have come up now, and I had wished we had seen it earlier to discuss within the commentary. And this is the phenomenon of girls doing increasingly well in education and boys dropping behind. On face value, it looks like a probably positive trend because this is where we've been trying to get to with relation to parity and the involvement of girls. But a trend we are seeing here, which today, which missed the commentary, was that those boys who are missing from the educational sector, number one, 
go and join the fathers already gaining capital in employment, in politics, in business. So by the time the girls finish school, these boys are their gatekeepers, even with less education. Another phenomenon we have seen is reflected, we've discussed this in the commentary, in the vertical, no, horizontal segregation. That is the choice of girls in feminine, quote and unquote, areas and boys for the more technical areas. How this is playing out now and we are seeing is that boys are dropping out of school earlier to go into technical education, which does not need probably a tertiary education. And before you are aware, they have these certificates, they're in the oil industry, petrochemical industry, in mining industry, and making good salaries as opposed to the girls who would want to teach and would spend five more years getting a master's degree. So the increasing uh, good showing of girls is not necessarily what we think it to be and we need to investigate it. So this is the paradox that we have seen. It didn't come out so well, but at least we've looked at the segregation. Patricia is looking at the time. <laughs> Third, we have tried also to emphasize the developmental dividend because and, uh, the CEDAR committee is both a human, the CEDAR convention is both a human rights convention as well as a developmental convention. We see this in Article 3. So we emphasize the importance of education in placing girls in a position where they have more control of their fertility and maternal mortality, nutrition, a guarantee against child marriages and early marriages. Uh, opportunity to further education, decent employment, the breaking of the cycle of intergenerational poverty and the provision of intergenerational dividends and the reducing of the vulnerability to violence and participating <laughs> in civic education. To do this, the education system must be an empowering one. It must give the girls, as we have looked at in our rights through education, the opportunity to... <clears throat> deal with the conflict they come into in authority and leadership roles as a practice for uh, life. It must also give them leadership within particularly tertiary uh, environments that they can, they can progress as well as their male professors. Uh, finally, again, I pay tribute. As I said, my chapter on education is personal. My mother was a teacher and she was allowed by her parents to leave the girls' school, the convent education, to go into the first co-educational school in Ghana. Without that, I do not think that I would have been where I am, given the space to work in education and to get the kind of education that I have got. So I look at education as a liberating right as well as a gatekeeping right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the in-depth analysis and the personal testimonial also to the role of education. Um, our next speaker is Judge Aruna Dinarain, who will take us through the issue of equality before the law as expressed in Article 15. This article is linked closely to Articles 1, 2, and 16, but also it concerns all others since it defines legal capacity. Aruna, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. And as you've just heard, I am a judge of the Supreme Court of Mauritius and a past, well, you haven't heard, but I am a past vice chair and rapporteur of the uh, CEDAW committee. Uh, allow me to thank the um, Maison de la Paix for hosting this event and the Swiss government for funding and facilitating my physical participation today. I'm very pleased to be here today. And I also wish to acknowledge the presence of distinguished past chairs of the committee whom I proudly refer to as CEDAW alumni. Um, whose ongoing contribution to furthering women's rights buttresses 
and continues to buttress the implementation of CEDAW. So thank you for being here today. So I'm here uh, to introduce my chapter in Article 15, which as I have acknowledged in the footnote at page 553 of the commentary, for those of you who have a copy in your hands, builds upon the excellent chapter on Article 15 in the first edition by Professor Savitri Gunesekere, who was at the University of Colombo and was a former committee member. Now, Article 15, dear audience, is a little known, little mentioned, less documented article of the convention, a parent pauvre, almost, as we would say in French. Why? Often because much of what one might have liked to raise under the general rubric, equality before the law, has, as Patricia said, already been raised under the powerful fundamental articles one and two at the very outset, or at times under various substantive articles. Again, as Patricia has pointed out. More importantly, however, it is often tried unsuccessfully to compete at the end of the dialogue when the delegation and the committee are running out of time with the more glamorous Article 16, <laughs> which deals with equality in marriage and family relations. And as I mentioned in my chapter, adequate consideration of Article 15 probably suffers from its being lumped together with Article 16 in part four of the convention, so that both the delegation and the committee often feel they have dealt somehow with Article 15, when in fact they spent most, if not all, of the limited time on the no doubt very complex issues raised by Article 16. This is what I have referred to in my chapter as Article 15 being subsumed under Article 16. But I hasten to say that I agree with all that Ruth has said, and nothing that I say right now should be seen as being uh, uh, in contradiction with what you said. I'm just simply adding my own little plea under Article 15. I was happy and honored, nonetheless, to be invited to write the chapter of the commentary on Article 15. I still remember where I was when I was first sounded for the task. <laughs> it was at an Euro Asia Pacific Colloquium in Colombo, Sri Lanka in 2019, when I was participating in the drafting of what would become the Colombo Declaration on the role of the judiciary in advancing women's right to equality in marriage and family relations, together with Ruth Kadari, future editor, and Andrew Burns, future author of the chapter in articles one and two. Allow me to quickly express my warm thanks to Ruth and all the other editors, especially my très chère amie and mentor, Patricia Schulz, a CEDO icon who is known for her rigor <laughs> and high standards. And she was, if I may call it that, my editing supervisor. As you can imagine, finalizing one's chapter with such an exacting task mistress was not exactly a piece of cake. <laughs> it was very demanding, very fulfilling. Merci, chère Patricia. Back to Colombo. Despite my heavy judicial caseload in Mauritius, I said yes, of course. As a sitting judge, I cannot miss an opportunity to promote equality before the law. More importantly, as the editor's introduction at page 17 of the commentary acknowledges, the committee may not have fully explored the potential of Article 15 yet. So this was my main challenge, trying to bring together the achievements, the work of the committee, the challenges under Article 15, in a way that would encourage the committee, states, NGOs, academics, stakeholders to delve deeper into Article 15. So that's the untapped potential of Article 15, and I hope I have succeeded. One of the major developments relating to Article 15 in between the two editions came in the form of General Recommendation Number 33 of 2015 on, on women's access to justice, which I cite and discuss at length. GR 33 gets considerable attention in my chapter, and I'm not going to quote uh, every line, uh, and you'll be familiar with the six components of access to justice set out in the GR, justiciability, availability, accessibility, good quality, provision of remedies for victims, and accountability of justice systems. I also highlighted commu communications and inquiries invoking a breach of Article 15, usually in conjunction with other articles. There have been 12 communications and two inquiries invoking inter alia Article 15 under the optional protocol to CEDAW, and I have set them out. I, of course, updated reference to the concluding observations under the different paragraphs of Article 15, for which I thank my intern, Lena Kologi, who was supposed to be here this morning, but whom I can't see yet, and who worked with me virtually during and after the 2020 lockdown. 
We also updated reference to reservations. Sadly, Article 15 is one of the articles to which reservations remain. We mentioned how consistently the committee asks that these reservations be withdrawn and point to more progressive stance from states parties from the same region or having the same legal system. And very generally, I have made sure I have added reference to international criminal justice, the International Criminal Court in particular, as well as regional instruments, and in particular, the Maputo Protocol from our part of the world. Now, at the time I wrote my piece on Article 15 during the first lockdown in 2020, I didn't know I would not be given leave by my office to seek a second term as elected member after 2022. So there was probably some wishful thinking when I made in the conclusion of my chapter at page 576 of the commentary, the following suggestions at the level of the committee. Firstly, that there be a general recommendation giving guidance on each provision of Article 15. This, of course, is unlikely when you uh, bear in mind the resource constraints faced by the uh, committee in elaborating general uh, recommendations. Secondly, that the committee gives a broader interpretation to Article 15 by linking it to components of access to justice laid down in general recommendation number 33. Thirdly, that the committee clusters articles 1 and 2 and 15 at the convention of the convention at the outset and allows articles to see all its glory at the end. <laughs> not that that Chris would agree with that. But of course, even to that, there is uh, ongoing resistance. And I look here at uh, Yoko Hayashi because she was chair of the Working Group on Working Methods when I was vice chair. And we all remember what happened uh, when we tried uh, to do this. And the fourth possibility, which I did not mention in my chapter, but which to some extent is being implemented by the committee, is that different members of the, com of the committee tackle Article 15 and Article 16. So make sure that each of those two uh, concluding articles gets uh, adequate um, uh, importance. I think I'll leave you with these proposals, and I look forward to hearing from the audience, from past and very distinguished chairs, present members, if any, and non-members of the committee present, as to how realistic these proposals are and how Article 15 can one day be given the importance and attention it justly deserves. Hopefully my chapter will have helped, however modestly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aruna. I must confess, I didn't think this colloquium would turn into a psychoanalysis. <laughs> You have revealed my controlling mind. <laughs> I hope you won't continue on this. Uh, line. Um, you should know since you're controlling your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I give the floor now to Professor Beate Rudolph, who will take us into economic and social rights as per Article 13. We know they are undermined by increasing inequality, and yet they condition what they call in Spanish the buen vivir, the good living, um, and they necessitate also the respect for civil and political rights. Beata, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Patricia, and uh, also from my side, first of all, a very warm welcome. Thank you for your interest and thank you for being here in the, in the room, but also online uh, to celebrate with us uh, the, the commentary that uh, tries to do uh, justice to the work of the committee, um, but uh, that work could not um, have achieved what it did without women's organizations from all over the world and um, scholars. And uh, so I pay my tribute to you all for the work and that has an also in the work that had impact on, on Article 13 that I'm speaking of. I would also like to thank from um, the bottom of my heart the co -author, the authors of the commentary because they went uh, with us through a long um, and difficult time, uh, especially during um, COVID, and we are happy um, that um, the undertaking led to um, a wonderful um, result. And lastly, um, I would like to thank um, uh, Patricia, um, Ruth, and Marsha um, for being co-editors um, for um, the great, I think, learning experience um, together. Um, and I would uh, nevertheless like to echo what Ruth has said, namely that, um, Patricia, without you, we would not have come to the end of um, the, the project. You've been um, the core of it. Thank you so much for, for that. 
Um, and I would add my gratitude to Karin Young, my assistant at the German Institute, who was the organizational core um, without which the project could not have um, reached its, uh, its end. 15 years ago, when we, uh, at the beginning of the commentary project, the first edition, Marsha Freeman um, uh, used to call Article 13 an orphan. Um, why? Because uh, that provision did not have parents that took care of it. Um, the committee dealt with Article 13 somehow in a haphazard um, way. And this changed dramatically since the first edition. The reason um, in my analysis is a shift of perspective. Um, Article uh, 13 was, when it was drafted, was a provision on leftovers. The drafters looked at the convention and said, so what has been left out? Okay, we have Article 11, labor, um, but what about self-employed women or other economic activities? Then um, social law, um, uh, what was covered? Yes, we think about family benefits, payments by the states, but the whole area of um, social law was not um, covered. Then um, the draft said, oh, and, and what about social life, sports and culture? Um, and that was, was put into Article 13 um, as well. So, so from the text, it looks like um, just bringing together what is not in the other provisions. Um, however, the shift of perspective was brought about by the CEDA committee when it introduced the cluster economic empowerment of women. Um, because that, in my uh, understanding, what meant that Article 13 was taken seriously um, as a provision to combat discrimination of women in all uh, areas of economic and social life. Um, and that means to look at economic and social life and ask where are the obstacles? What prevents women from uh, acting on the basis of equality in these areas? And that had several uh, consequences. It had the consequence that the um, the committee looked um, at women as economic actors, in particular self-employed women, um, being well aware that women in informal um, employment in, in family businesses were covered by Article 11. But beyond that, women as economic actors, um, I think, changed the perspective on, on women, on them as autonomous subjects of economy. And secondly, um, all areas of economic and social life meant to take up all the issues of um, economic and social um, and cultural rights. And among them in particular, uh, right to food, right to housing, right to water as rights that need um, a focus uh, of the committee as well. And then and Patricia already um, uh, referred to it, Article 13 requires taking into account certain civil rights that support the um, exercise of economic rights. For example, access to public transportation. Um, as a, a self-employed woman, you're depending on that. As a woman, um, in, um, in, uh, an employed woman, you have uh, a need to access public transportation. You have the need to a freedom of movement. In addition, I think the, um, the way that the committee used um, Article 13, the way it looked at the economic empowerment of women, um, it brought forward um, social rights uh, and showed the interaction of um, economic rights um, and uh, social rights, and that far beyond what is in the text of Article 13, namely that the question of um, social security for non-employed women, for self-employed women, um, and that uh, the committee did um, before the, um, the background that uh, women who are not in employment contribute to a large extent to the economy of states through care work, for example, and that needs to be reflected um, uh, in the actions of the state uh, to ensure full participation in economic and social life. Uh, and it also covers, therefore, social services, like questions of uh, child care, making sure that women who take uh, up, um, care work for older relatives um, are also covered uh, by social security, um, for example, um, and can thus contribute to the development of society. 
The second reason for the shift of perspective by the CEDAW committee, um, in my understanding, is General Recommendation 28. Um, the general recommendation that looked at women in their diversity and that took up the issue of intersectionality, as Andrew Burns already referred to. And that meant that the committee looked at different groups of women, displaced women, refugee women, migrant women, homeless women, women with disabilities, women in informal settlements, just to, to name just a few whose full participation in economic and social life is particularly um, uh, 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 impacted um, and who suffer discrimination in those respects. I cannot do justice here to the rich um, jurisprudence of the committee, its analysis of the situation of women. I try to do that in the commentary to, to show how much there is um, also for states um, to work uh, on these issues. Um, I think the dollar analysis of the committee of the obstacles that women face in, these, um, uh, in economic and social life is especially relevant also for the implementation of the SDGs, SDG uh, one and two on um, uh, ending poverty and hunger. Uh, that is one that needs a gender perspective and the jurisprudence of the CEDAW committee contributes mu very much to it that is still in my view underused so far. Um, women as economic actors and the interconnectedness of economic and social measures is something that needs to be um, explored in more detail. Um, I would like to, with looking into the future, I think with, we have Article 14 for women in rural areas. Uh, Article 13 is the provision for women, um, disadvantaged women in other areas. I'm looking at the development of mega cities, for example, um, and the situation of marginalized women um, in, uh, in those cities. So this is something that in the future, I think will play a role. And lastly, I would like to point to um, what the committee also did, and it was mentioned um, already a few times, extraterritoriality, that looking at extraterritorial obligations on the one hand and um, Article 13 on the other, uh, the committee explored the responsibility of states with regard to business activities, um, but also with regard to economic measures in crisis situations. Um, but we have, uh, in particular, the jurisprudence that started around the time the first edition was published um, on austerity measures. This, the committee still focuses most on the state affected, the target state of agreements um, or actions by international or, uh, organizations. Um, and um, I would uh, humbly, humbly suge suggest that that should be broadened to the obligation of the state's that act in international organizations um, and also um, to states that act through bilateral or multilateral uh, agreements with states in, uh, um, in austerity situations. Uh, and I believe that as a result, both of the COVID um, pandemic, but also of the war against of Russia against the Ukraine, we will see austerity measures coming up again, and there's a need to focus um, on making sure that women are not at the short end of the state's measures. As a vision for the future, um, I think Article 13 is a reminder that the economic and social spheres cannot be considered separately. Article 13 requires us to question whether our economic system is viable, giving um, its devastating impact on the survival of humankind. And Article 13 is a stark reminder that economy must serve society as a whole. And that means women in particular, especially the most um, disadvantaged. The interrelatedness of economic and social life uh, shows and in the work of the committee that Article 13 has moved from being an orphan to being a provision that is at the center of the CEDAW Convention. And that is thanks to the work of the committee, civil society and scholars. And I'm looking forward to us all together to moving that forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now come to our last speaker, 
Sulini Sarugaser Hung, a human rights lawyer working with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. You will speak on the right to nationality according to Article 9, which is often defined as the right to have rights. And I thought, considering the extreme discrimination that non nationals experience in so many countries, I found fitting to end these presentations with these burning issues. Sulini, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Patricia. And uh, I'm so um, honored to be sitting on this panel. And uh, as you had said, the, the social aspect, um, as well as the, the professional aspect have really come together. And we've worked together in different capacities um, as part of the secretariat for the CEDAW committee, as part of um, working with NHRIs, working as an international consultant. Currently, I am at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I have supported the CEDAW committee since 2016 in different, um, in different capacities. So it's a real pleasure to be here and the amount that I have learned. In fact, I remember in 2016 when I discovered the first commentary and I saw Beata's name on it, and I thought, my gosh, Beata and I go back to our NHRI days. And I said, oh, Beata, can I have a copy? And this I absorbed the whole of this book and it helped me so much in supporting the CEDAW members. So that's my plug for being able to get this uh, fabulous commentary. And I believe that one of the reasons that Patricia maybe might have and um, Beata and Ruth might have approached me is because they knew that I knew the convention and they knew that I could be concise. So <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> yeah, and I can see your, your clock there. So um, I've, I've, I'm so pleased to have been invited to write the chapter on Article 9, um, the equal rights to nationality. So this is not to be distinguished from the right to nationality. And um, again, when I come back to why it is that I think that uh, the, um, the diverse perspectives of this panel matter so much is because we have the academic perspective of really, you know, um, for a living you are uh, unpacking, you know, each of the legal elements in the text. Then we have the practitioner's perspective and the CEDAW member experts who have the whole globe travel to them for about a quarter of the year in a meeting room, it used to be room 16, uh, in Palais de Nation, now room 23, of which CSOs and, and, um, so, and uh, state parties would come. And then you have the secretariat members like myself who uh, support the committee and support other committees and really understand the mechanisms of the human rights um, world and the human rights council, the general assembly, and are able to bring all of these perspectives together in, in shedding light on these articles. So coming back to article nine, <laughs> What Patricia had really instructed us on today was to talk about really what gripped us in writing this article, and um, because I'm sure you will all go and read the articles and get the, the legal analysis <laughs> yourself. And what would really, and again, you know, I think Patricia actually scooped my line that it is the right to have rights, and it really falls within the structure of this convention, this beautiful convention of 16 substantive articles, which the committee um, treats exhaustively. And it is the bridge between the civil and political rights, articles seven and eight, and um, then the social, economic, cultural rights, right to education, right to health, uh, employment, et cetera. And with the value of nationality and why it is so important to the CEDAW committee, because this is, this is a book about CEDAW committee jurisprudence and how it has interpreted the convention. And so really scrolling through hundreds of concluding observations and views, et cetera, on, on, uh, and, and inquiry reports uh, and understanding really why this article matters so much to the committee. It's because it's really understood the value of nationality, the value of having citizenship entitles you to full membership within a country, within a society, and entitlement to all of the rights to which those nationals have. So when this is restricted in any shape or form with respect to transmission of the nationality, with respect to acquisition, et cetera, um, then there are evidently lower socioeconomic indicators that come from this because you do not have access to that full spectrum of rights. So understanding this to be really the, the crux of the matter, then the CEDAW committee has really insisted very much on how in avoiding these kinds of situations of vulnerability that are precipitated by lower socioeconomic indicators, 
it's important right throughout the whole life cycle of the woman beginning as a girl to have the uh, a birth certificate to be documented and this so many of the restrictions in which the because there are only about 25 countries in the world which have direct restrictions on uh, women's rights um, with respect to nationality in terms of acquiring it transmitting it etc but really there are so many issues that fall on um, with respect to undocumented uh, nationals as well who have no entitlement to rights. So when we look at what this golden standard of, 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 um, uh, of um, entitlement to rights is through having citizenship, the opposite of that would be having um, no entitlement to rights, which might be otherwise known as being stateless. Now, stateless is a term of art, and it's uh, it's determined through a specific procedure. But we also, and I suppose in the CEDAW committee, stumbles upon many cases of many individuals that have, especially in remote and rural underserved country and uh, underserved parts of the country, which have um, which do not even have access to any kind of uh, official documentation, whether this is official ID, whether it's birth registration, and so this is something that comes up over and over again in the concluding observations. Now, coming back to my point about being concise, I think I'm actually going to wrap up here and say the major point of what is um, new developments in this area and why this right to nationality will be increasingly, or this right to equal rights and nationality will be increasingly important is because we see an increasingly global movement of people, whether this is voluntary or involuntary, whether it is for family reunification reasons, whether it's for a better um, jobs, or whether it is because you are forced to move out of your island because of climate change or it could be a conflict. Now, in these circumstances, where you have populations which are without, that are displaced and without the proper identification, this then becomes increasingly harder to be able to access just even the basic rights to healthcare, to education, et cetera. Um, the article, it's, it's a shortly written article, but it is exhaustive in so many different ways. And I hope that we have been able to cover it in the commentary. And again, I close with a great thanks to this panel and for the opportunities that um, come out of just being knowing you and being associated with you. So congratulations again. Thank you very much. I believe that uh, this panel has um, illustrated the fascinating process that we um, went through uh, with working on the project. And um, uh, also, I hadn't mentioned that, uh, um, Hilary, you joined us with Barbara Bailey uh, in a time of dire need because the planned author had to uh, give up uh, writing that chapter on education and we, we came to you uh, with the hope, we were trembling, <laughs> with the hope that you would accept um, our proposal of participating in this and you gracefully uh, came upon board. So I, I want to thank you authors, editors present here, authors and our editor absent today, but uh, with us online. And um, I think I will, I have a few questions, but I would first like to give the floor an opportunity to respond, to ask questions actually. So who would like the, the floor? Yes, at the end of the room. Hello. Hello. Um, I may just introduce myself. I'm Judith Border, and I'm a researcher and lecturer at the University of Vienna, and just submitted a manuscript, um, um, a Sea Dog book. And I had a question for um, Madame Rudolph. Um, because what I analyzed when, you know, looking at property rights and how they are dealt with under the CEDAW convention, I really wondered how much Article 13 is really used in the jurisprudence of the comedy and um, how that becomes visible. Because I sometimes wasn't certain if the comedy does not deal with um, Article like does not extend Article 14 more so from real women to also, you know, other differently situated women. 
and encompasses them through Article 14 when it comes to housing rights and all the other economic and social rights that are encompassed in the chapeau, uh, whether it actually, um, you know, um, does deal with um, those issues under Article 13. And my question for you really is how to recognize um, this, or like under what article I should actually present the information when the comedy itself does not make this explicit. And, you know, like as international lawyers, you sometimes have to delineate and then like also when you adv advise civil society, like what should you bring your claim under and what is the most useful and provision and how can Article 13 maybe even have this great potential that you just uh, presented? Because I see too, <laughs> I just wonder how much it's already reflected. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, so thank you very much for the question. Um, and maybe to put it more sharply, sometimes I felt that Article 13 is the Lord Voldemort of the CEDAW Convention <laughs> because it is not uh, named. Um, uh, give me an, let me give you an example on, for example, the um, uh, decisions on Roma women uh, in, um, in individual complaint procedures. The question of housing there is not one under Article 14 in many uh, cases, uh, but these are women uh, living in um, slum areas uh, at, at the outskirts of cities. Um, and the CEDA committee dealt with the issues that, to my understanding, conceptually belong under Article 13, but Article 13 is not expressly mentioned, which may have to do with the fact that applicants um, also did not refer to Article 13 because it's still considered by many as this uh, leftover um, provision um, that uh, it doesn't have a strong character of its own. So therefore, um, what I also tried in my chapter is to do, I, I use the lens that the CEDAW committee applies, and that is look at social and uh, economic life, look at marginalized um, uh, groups of, of women, uh, see that, that connection, and that is something that clearly falls under Article 13, even if it is not mentioned. Um, and I think that's the good thing about this approach is that, uh, first of all, we are starting from the, the life situation of women um, and say, what, is, what are the, uh, the, the obstacles? Where do they uh, uh, um, experience discrimination? And from there, we take it and the committee as a whole and the interrelatedness also of Article 13 with many other provisions, then uh, that do not make it so necessary to name all the provisions, but rather to say, look, after all, this is discrimination um, covered by the various provisions of the convention. Yes, I would add that I think that in such cases, as you mentioned, uh, the committee should of itself uh, consider uh, the, its response and build its views also on articles not mentioned by the claimant. I think that's a responsibility for the committee to do so for the future. But uh, Ruth, you wanted to intervene as yes, well. Yes, I, I, I wanted, I wanted to, to mention that property rights are also very, very strongly related to Article 16 as questions of inheritance, and the um, lack of inheritance rights for women in many, many regions, inheriting as daughters. Um, women are still excluded from inheriting in many countries. Um, and in relation to distribution of the property after marital breakdown or after the death of, so inheriting as a, as a spouse. Um, and, and, and I know that in um, international uh, scholarly work, um, this is sometimes overlooked, this relationship between women's property rights and women's rights within marriage or within the family, and it, it must, be, must be highlighted. Um, and it's not just the um, possibility of the committee to, um, to, to make new path in this relation, it's also, I think you mentioned the um, role of uh, civil society in bringing information. You asked about how to divert attention of the committee. Um, so so there is a, there's a large role for civil society. I think that we emphasize this greatly in the, in the book um, in, in bringing up the attention, in providing information, and in also um, organizing this information under the various um, articles of the, of the committee. Um, so I, I, I agree, this, this should be developed 
um, much, much further. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. And of course, I totally agree uh, with what um, uh, has just been said by uh, Ruth and uh, uh, Professor Rudolph. But that illustrates what I was saying uh, again about Article 15, because as you all know, the Article 15 as well, uh, mention is made of the, um, uh, equal, um, of the equal right to uh, administer property and conclude contracts. And again, this is something that should and could be raised in the Article uh, 15. Thank you. Yes, I will add one thing um, in regard to civil society. Oh, sorry, Andrew, I'll give you the floor first. No, no please, Patricia, why don't you finish finish off on that point and mine's another. Yep. Okay, then I'll finish what I wanted to say about civil society. We have dedicated the commentary to civil society organizations and women human rights defenders to honor their work, their guts, uh, their tenacity, and so that's it. Thank you, civil society. Now, Andrew, um, you have the floor. Great, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Look, I just wanted to respond to the, the intervention in the chat and the questions that uh, Ksenia Kirichenko has has asked on the question of uh, the convention and transgender uh, issues, trans women. Um, so really, just like, yep, just just to uh, to say yes. I mean, certainly in the chapter on Article One, there is a there's a <laughs> section which is much expanded, at pages ninety four to ninety nine, and it addresses some of the issues that that uh, you raise, Xenia, um, and. If you're working in this area, I'm probably telling you something you already know. But there's there's a quite a recent good paper put out by International Women's Rights Action Watch Asia Pacific. I think it must be late 2022 or early 2023, called "Universalizing Gender Equality Norms: Looking at CEDAW's Role in Relation to SOGI Rights, Including Trans Rights." The problem, and I, I'm going to throw this to to those who've been members of the committee or close to it. Um, as a scholar looking at it from outside, you're, you're reading tea leaves, uh, and the tea leaves are the, are the, are the <laughs> continuing, concluding observations, the uh, the lists of intersectional categories in the uh, con concluding observations and, uh, and general uh, recommendations. And of course, I think someone, uh, someone said uh, earlier, what's not said, you don't necessarily see. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And I, and I imagine that there may have been a variety of opinions on this sort of issue within the committee, uh, not necessarily coming from a, a from an uh, an anti human rights perspective. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll leave that there in case anyone wants to to come back back on that. But certainly, I think CEDAW has done a careful uh, and consistent job on picking up the sorts of things and making the sorts of recommendations that you've identified some of uh, Ksenia and also in other other areas. Thanks. Explain what the question was. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I think this answers a question we had in the chat uh, whether the commentary speaks about the rights of trans women. Yes, it does. And um, that, uh, and whether uh, we consider panelists and moderator uh, whether uh, trans women's rights um, should be protected by CEDAW. And the answer is yes. So now I saw that um, Feride Aja, you have the you have a question. Thank you. Well, it's uh, thank you very much. Uh, my qu my question is really for the whole panel. It's a general question. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, really uh, for the wonderful feast that we have been served this morning with this panel of uh, distinguished speakers who have uh, dealt. Uh, delved into the issues and you have bring, uh, brought me personally, I should say, a lot up to date. I have not been uh, part of the CEDO committee for the last five years. And so this has really been a wonderful catching up exercise. And I thank you all for uh, providing this. My question is now re uh, related to all the articles and some of those that, have, that were not presented here. It's about uh, how much um, 
role or how much reference is made in this commentary. And I will admit that I have not seen or read it yet. Uh, I, how much reference is made to the general recommendations specifically uh, in terms of all the articles? Because after all the change and uh, the uh, what we observe in the uh, working of the and the product of the committee is very much in line with uh, what's going on on the recommendations side. This committee is providing recommendations. And yet, we, since this is a panel that is also addressed mainly uh, to the civil society, uh, I personally feel, especially when I'm uh, further away from the committee now, that the general recommendations are really not all that known at all in the, uh, out there by civil society. So uh, I was wondering to uh, what is the degree of specific reference to the general recommendations under each article in this commentary uh, to also make them more uh, um, known to the civil society and to academia, because this is a commentary. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much. I think we'll take um, also um, Dubrovka Simonovic's question, um, and then we'll try and answer both of your questions. In Thank you. I was not planning to raise the question, but I was inspired by very dear child sitting next to me. And I would like to thank you very much for organizing this uh, presentation of uh, second commentary of uh, CEDO. And I'm very glad to be here to uh, be able to recall back memories uh, of being CEDO committee member for 12 years. Um, I also didn't read uh, commentary yet, but I have plans to uh, read it in the future. And I would uh, carefully look at part related to violence against women, because we all know that the huge progress done by CEDAW committee, specifically in this area of violence against women, is extremely important, since there is no specific article of CEDAW convention that is addressing violence against women. But from early on, CEDAW committee members, our predecessors started to request reports from state parties on violence against women, then adopted General Recommendation 19, later on General Recommendation number 35, and uh, my colleague Farida Char was heading the working group. I was at that time Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, and I participated in the work of the CEDAW committee, what was also unique to have a work of two different independent mechanisms at the UN level, although at the end it was the CEDAW committee's general recommendation number 35, that really um, somehow captured the progress uh, done by CEDAW committee in this area. But my question now is also using perspective as a special rapporteur on violence against women for six years from 2015 to 21, is CEDAW now perceived as a treaty that is dealing with discrimination against women and violence against women, gender-based violence against women. Because now we do have this uh, uh, inclusion of violence against women in jurisprudence, in general recommendations and so on. But is general perspective of the CEDO convention at the level of full inclusion of violence against women under its scope? So basically I think is now CEDO at the stage that all others, the whole community, NGOs, and all that are using CEDO are saying this is Convention on Elimination of Discrimination and Gender-Based Violence Against Women and Girls, and what should be done if we are not yet there? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll first uh, tackle um, Ferry Diaja's a question regarding um, how or if and to what extent general recommendations have been included in the commentary. So I would like to ask each of you to respond, maybe giving an example or, or saying how you dealt with this mass of general recommendations and how to address them. Thank you, Patricia. <coughs> and it is a delight to see you, Farida. We sat close to each other all the years you were on the committee, thank you. Yes, um, I think probably the most guilty chapter for over including the general recommendations <laughs> would be my chapter 10. <laughs> <laughs> on the first or second page, I don't have the commentary behind me, yeah. but I have the, uh, the, the e-copy, yes. 
it must be the second page or so. We have walked through every general recommendation that contained a reference to education. So right from general recommendation five, we said exactly what it says about education, equal access to education for women with disabilities. And we've walked through every one of them. The footnotes alone take through quarters of the page, of that page. Mm -hmm. Then within the text, we have also referred to uh, frequently to general recommendation uh, 36, which is specifically on the education. So this is talking about the chapter 10 and the importance of referencing. I do uh, appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Acha, uh, Professor Acha, your comment. And even before you left the committee, I think you will recall that in our concluding observations, we always referred under each heading to the re uh, relevant general recommendation. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, um, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Acha, for this uh, question. Um, I think probably the editors will say so themselves, but when they actually guided us towards writing our chapters, they actually mentioned specifically general recommendations. So I think all the authors have ensured that uh, adequate reference um, is made to the general recommendations, and you will see it for yourself when you get a copy of the commentary between your hands. Um, uh, I, I've already said that in my chapter, I have uh, made a lot of reference to general recommendation 33. Uh, and uh, you will see in the uh, appropriate chapters, a lot of reference being made to uh, general recommendation number 35. And I think uh, not only in the um, commentary, but uh, as a person who's, as a member who's just left the committee uh, last December, I think uh, um, uh, um, Hillary, who is the only sitting member present today will confirm that uh, increasingly now the committee ensures that the greater reference is made to the uh, general recommendations. So um, you mentioned the concluding observations, of course, a reference to the general recommendations, but also, as you will have seen in the communications, we, and, and, and increasingly, uh, and more and more the reference that is made is to your own recommendation for the 35 in, in most of the communications recently invoking breach of um, Article 5, references made to, to GR. Of course, there was a debate as to whether it should be breach of or whether it is interpretation. So we've tried to find language to take this into account. But the rest showed that the committee, uh, 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 on whose behalf I can no longer speak, but as an author, I can say that, and as a past member, I can say that uh, adequate reference is made to general recommendations in the work of the committee. Thank you. So I'll just I'll just add very quickly that um, I think that uh, us past members um, we, we we share this concern that general recommendations are not enough known outside the committee. But this was in fact the purpose of the instructions that Zabruna said that we gave to all the authors to interweave them into the chapters. So I'm just looking at the index here, and I think that we should acknowledge the excellent work on the index. Um, of, of this book, it's extremely, extremely helpful. And the, a whole column on, on the right hand side here gives references, specific references to all the general recommendations throughout the chapters. And I just did a quick search on my own chapter and found 88 references to general recommendations in the, in the text. So rest assured. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and um, would you like to add something? Is that, I simply would like to add, um, just the, the other way around. So I'm echoing what has been said, but uh, I think particularly for Article 13, it would be extremely helpful to have a general recommendation to bring together what the committee has done and to give that provision a different <coughs> visibility. And I also echo what Megan Camp Campbell, one of our uh, authors uh, of the commentary um, said five years ago that there should be general recommendation on poverty and there's intellect inter relationship between the two, but it's not, um, and not equal. So I think there are there are issues that um, could be um, covered by general recommendations and strengthening provisions of the um, the commentary. But that's just an addition to what has been said. I just so, add something very quickly, Patricia. I think it's a valid comment, and I can see that I, I know that I had cited um, in the um, in this Article Nine uh, chapter the general recommendation number thirty two <coughs> on the gender related dimensions of refugee status, asylum, nationality, and stat statelessness of women. But um, a point I'd like to make, I think, with regards to the strength of the commentary is that um, 
this general recommendation dates to 2014. And uh, it is obviously still relevant today, but the beauty of this commentary is that it's very current. And we were also just given instructions to make sure that we exhaustively covered the jurisprudence, <laughs> the communications, the general recommendations, the inquiry reports of uh, the committee over the last um, about 11 years. So now that we're heading towards 2024, um, it's, it's a very good update. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You would like to yep. actually make I'd, 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 Yeah, look, same, same with articles one and two. I won't list them all, but sort of, uh, I mean, general recommendations, I think, for the scholar, the commentator, the, the advocate, sort of like bread to a starving person. Uh, you know, we have the, the, bare, the bare bones of the convention, if I can mix my metaphor, and one is desperate for detailed guidance. And that's that's why the general recommendations are so important and the jurisprudence and, and the inquiries. So I can assure you, I can't, and, and hello Farida and, and Dubravka, I can't see you, I, I can only see the panel. Um, I can assure both of you that uh, the general recommendations are used, any of us who teach, any of us who are advocates before national courts, our human rights commissions, are using them all all the time and that includes those related to violence and i'd say yes cedar is very much a linchpin of at least in my country australia uh work on violence against against women which remains to be done and there's another question on uh older women uh and it seems to me that uh, it's, it's probably timely to just uh, mention general recommendation 27 on older women which is a a terrific reference point one of the few up-to-date ones in the current international human rights framework um, CEDAW has done very well on this, uh, although the system, there's a big push at the moment for a new convention on the rights of older persons, um, uh, supported by, among others, uh, Beata's colleague, the independent expert on the rights of the older persons, Claudia Marla. But that's somewhere where uh, CEDAW has been doing terrific, terrific work, I think, as well, and can be, that can be used. Thank you. Yes, I would like to add a few words. Um, we also tried in the, throughout the commentary to cross-reference from chapter to chapter to various GRs. So that was a, a consistent uh, effort. Um, coming back to GR 32, and I want to speak about it to show the evolution in the work and the thinking <coughs> of the committee and the role that GRs can play. Uh, I think it's in GR 32 that we really dealt in depth to, into the issue of extraterritoriality. Uh, Dubravka, if I'm not mistaken, that was really when we, we tried to get our ideas absolutely clear so that we could come up with a um, well-grounded uh, well recommendation. Um, and from there, the work on extraterritoriality grew into other spheres. So I think it's interesting to go back to the gene genealogy, if I may say, of uh, the thinking of the committee. Now to um, your question, Dubravka, whether uh, the convention is now considered as the, the treaty that deals with uh, both discrimination against women and violence against women, I would say that I believe that mainly this is so. Uh, and there has been no voice from the side of states, for instance, on the affirmation that we made in general recommendation 35, stating that the prohibition of violence against women is uh, belongs to international customary law. And this has not been discussed. Now, there is a group who has launched the idea of an every woman treaty that would be a new convention dealing specifically with violence against women and who would be um, um, con controlled or examined not by um, a group of experts in the field, but by a conference of parties. And I believe that this is um, um, a mistake, a mistake to want a different treaty on violence against women, because that would separate 
the fundamental link that exists between discrimination against women and violence. And this has been established by the CEDAW Committee in General Recommendation 19 in 1977, I think, or in 1988. Well, anyhow, uh, in General Recommendation 19, violence against women is a form of discrimination against women, violence against women and girls. Uh, and that's how the convention was enriched by the interpretation of the committee. And I would like to say that as well as there was no um, contestation of G GR 35, there was no contestation of GR 19. That is that after uh, its adoption, the committee started asking more pointed questions than it had previously. Previously, it had asked uh, countries based on GR 12, tell us if you have a law and if you have statistics on uh, gender-based violence. That was it. And after uh, that, the questioning, the interest of the committee grew very much to try and cover this huge phenomenon in all its various incarnations of violence against women. And so my, my conviction is that CEDO uh, is the, the treaty that covers both, I mean, that covers discrimination and violence against women being a form of discrimination. And I, I really hope that uh, the international community will be wise enough not to create another uh, convention with a very weird uh, control mechanism that would probably not be able to uh, examine the implementation of this special treaty properly. And that would probably come up with contradictory recommendations to what the CEDAW committee would say. And to that, I would like to add that fortunately, the CEDO committee is not the only treaty body that deals with violence against women, but that if not all, most of the other treaty bodies also deal with these issues under their own treaty. So I think we, we have, um, we have a certain uh, coherence at the international level, and to that comes, as you say, Ruth, uh, the regional level, which, uh, for instance, at the European level, gives a very detailed um, listing of the, the obligations of state parties and that in the Istanbul uh, Convention, which can be ratified by countries not in the European sphere, geographic European sphere, by the way. Yes, uh, just, just may uh, add a small point, and that is, mm -hmm. uh, I think it is important that the CEDAW committee remains uh, in the driving seat with respect to violence against women. So we have regional mechanisms like uh, under the Istanbul Convention um, on Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, but um, we must be um, careful that states not say we report to that mechanism to Gravio, which is doing a, a wonderful job, but they need to continue to report to the CEDAW committee and the CEDAW committee uh, needs to, to make sure that they uh, express um, what is what reflects the drafting history, the Belendo Para Convention, um, as well as the, uh, the Istanbul Convention are conventions that specify obligations arising out of CEDAW. And so CEDAW committee um, must, uh, must be the committee that reminds states of their obligations. And I'm saying that in particular, as we're seeing the backlash against women's human rights. Now look in Europe, all those um, uh, 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 fake news about the Istanbul Convention, it becoming um, the, um, the, the bogus, um, it becoming um, something that is distorted by governments who want to promote an anti gender equality agenda and anti-human rights agenda. And therefore, I think violence against women is still at the core of what the CEDAW committee does and has to remain so. Can I add one? Yes. Yeah. Very quickly, I, I think as a perspective of um, a professional that's working within the United Nations system, um, also within the treaty body specifically, 
We, as human rights officers, work for several different treaty body committees. And one of the uh, strengths of doing that is that we bring the influences from one committee to the other. So having worked very much with CEDAW, then going to work on the, with the Committee on the Convention Against Torture and seeing how this committee is now systematically treating domestic violence under its, uh, in its concluding observations. Recently, I supported the Committee on Migrant Workers and looking at um, the treatment of violence against um, migrant women workers and seeing where these influences come from. We're also instructed to cross-reference uh, concluding observations from one committee to the other as part of this whole treaty body strengthening process. So the, the ambit of, of the jurisprudence is, is quite large and is very effectively rippling through the whole system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Aruna. Uh, thank you very much. I obviously agree with whatever has been said by my uh, co-panelists. But I'll, again, as a, a member who's just left the committee, we've heard a lot about these uh, competing demands for a, a new convention. And I remember one of the things that was discussed at the level of the committees, it, since there seems to be appetite for a dedicated instrument, at the same time, we should be careful of not um, you know, uh, weakening the work of a CEDAW uh, committee uh, existing on, on the matter. And the, the, the one idea that was mooted was having an optional protocol specifically on gender-based violence under the convention. And maybe that might take care of all the, um, the um, ideas being expressed and the suggestions while not throwing the baby with the bath water and building on the work of the CEDAW committee, uh, but uh, making sure there is a dedicated instrument, but under the aegis of CEDAW. Thank you. Yes, um, um, Yoko Hayashi, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Patricia. So I'd like to join Farid Aja and Dubravka Simonovic to congratulate all the editors and authors of this uh, <laughs> commentary and the, today's launch. It, this is a wonderful occasion. I haven't received, I ordered the commentary, but have not received it. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the, <laughs> I, I cannot make any review on it. But the, um, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, um, one of the issues that has been emerged uh, immensely in the past 10 years is the agenda item of women, peace, and security. So I would like to know how this issue has been treated in the new commentary, not only under Article 8, but also an um, agenda item of the violence against women. So any speakers, yeah, I appreciate your sharing the view of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would uh, like to start answering uh, this question, and I want to link it to a question from the chat. Um, one question is related to how the committee's concluding observations and individual communications address context of armed conflict. And the author of the question refers to GR30 that uh, does uh, examine the topic quite comprehensively but asks, beyond this, does the commentary address issues of discrimination linked directly or indirectly uh, to armed conflict? And I thank the author of the question, who is an ICRC legal advisor. So we really are speaking with somebody um, with whom we have to speak. Thank you, Vanessa Murphy. Um, I really think that the, the, the commentary has dealt with these issues in under various chapters, actually. Uh, we have seen the impact of um, conflict on education. We saw it, I think, under health. Um, and so we really tried to address it wherever it is a necessity. Um, I don't know whether you would like to add something, Beate? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's also something, again, that comes under Article 13, because it's the question about um, <laughs> the post-conflict situation, rebuilding after conflict, and focusing there on, on economic um, measures. Um, uh, so in addition to, but you've already said it, uh, that, that the, the chapter on Article um, uh, 8, as well as the chapter on violence against women, deals with it extensively, um, 
so so again, I think that is that is the beauty um, of the commentary that um, even you know if you're not looking specifically, if you think I only find it in this chapter, you find the cross references, you get to other chapters and see where the committee has taken up um, the issue of, um, of of women, peace, and security, violence against women in armed conflict. Um, so that is um, the inter I think. In that respect, this year we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Vienna um, uh, World Conference on Human Rights and the um, uh, the, the interrelatedness uh, and indivisibility of all human rights. I think we see it in the commentary in the work of the committee um, reflected in, in the various chapters. Yeah, I um, forgot to, to mention um, also that I think that the committee uh, started asking questions to various countries about their arms trade. So that is directly linked with conflict, <laughs> as we unfortunately know. And so I think that has been uh, also linked to the expansion of the committee's thinking about extraterritoriality, a very important uh, connection made um, to, to ensure that the rights of women are being taken care of uh, I mean, in a nutshell, I would say that you can only sell arms to neutral countries who have no army. That would be the <laughs> <laughs> that would be the way to um, ensure that uh, there will be no conflicts that will affect the rights of uh, women and girls. Okay, so I think there was a question. Yes. Um, Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Um, I know that this will not be in the commentary, but I have a question because it's also related to war, migrant women and refugees. Um, and you mentioned that you analyzed um, so statelessness, nationality, and I think the next general recommendation will be on um, participation of women in public life. But I also wonder how you can dare, you know, bring in migrant and refugee women um, and in order for them, you know, to have some say in um, laws, procedures that very often reflect them that they cannot vote on. And um, this is, of course, not in the commentary um, yet, but I know that you are the experts in all the material. So I think I'd be very thankful um, for any assessment um, that you might provide or input on that question. So, Nini, yeah, you uh, to take that question? Th thank you for the question. And uh, you're right, it, that, that aspect was not uh, covered in the commentary, but the point was made in the commentary about, um, again, uh, women's participation in peace processes, uh, whether this is during the conflict or, or post conflict, depending on whether she is entitled to um, exercise all the rights that nationality then bestows on her, and whether this is, we have. It has treated um, in this chapter the issue of um, migrant women's rights and uh, their path towards naturalization, for example, and their ability to be able to contribute to the development uh, of, of the country uh, in um, both uh, during conflict and post-conflict situations. Maybe I'll just leave it there for now. Anybody? No? Is there a further question? Yes, please. It's, it's actually a comment following uh, on two points that have been made by the panel. I'm Patricia Scanella from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, and I wanted to follow up on what you, Patricia, said about uh, the arms trade, but also what Beata Rudolph said earlier about um, areas where the committee could look more into. Um, so Beata mentioned looking more about the role of states in international financial institutions, fully agree with that. It's something, it's it's a big role. Um, there are states that are playing big roles in those institutions that are influencing how the money then, those, for example, austerity measures that then conditionalities that are imposed in other countries. Um, another area where the committee has kind of sometimes asked questions and I believe it be, would be important to, um, do more on is actually looking at how the money gets spent. Um, there have been questions. So when you look at austerity measures in certain countries, at the same time you're seeing that somehow money is found to be spent on military and more like increasing military budgets. Um, and there have been, I remember a couple of occasions where the committee has asked questions, feeling like, mm, 
almost like it's not for us to tell you how you should spend the money, but here's a question. But it is obviously very relevant and it has such an important, such a key impact on economic and social culture rights as well as other rights uh, of you know, individuals protected under the, the, the convention. So I'd say that's, that's an area where it would be good uh, to see more of really looking at, you know, the, the choices that get made that do impact on, on how, um, uh, you know, then uh, women are uh, able to enjoy their rights. And on the arms trade, totally agree, Patricia, with you. It's, it's a, the committee was one that really took, it was almost like one of the first ones to kind of deal with this. And we feel it's, an, it's a really, uh, it, in many ways, almost uh, um, led the way for other committees who are now taking it on. Uh, and it's it's really good that other committees are taking on uh, this role from the perspective of extraterritorial obligations, as you said, Patricia, but also the GR35 on gender-based violence does talk about the impact of firearms, for example, and, and that they have so regulation as well at the national level. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Any further questions? Um, not from the room, not from the chat, and I have, I have a few things that I might <laughs> um, inquire about. Um, I would like to ask you from the analysis that you have made of the jurisprudence of the committee in your respective fields, uh, do you find sufficient consistency in the concluding observations and recommendations? And would you have suggestions for the committee? And of course, this goes back to what you said, Sulini, the, the effort to ensure coherence throughout the system. But for you, does it work sufficiently? Yes and no. There is a core that is consistent. But uh, I would say sometimes we have evolution. So I don't know whether that's what you're talking about. And when you look at, when you listen to uh, Professor Karari's um, uh, presentation, you have talked about an evolution over the time in the concluding observations. The consistency with the convention I have found is always there. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it, it, that has not changed. <laughs> but the bounds and the interpretation, as you yourself too have alluded to, is contemporary. It takes account of contemporary mm -hmm. truths. Yes. The consistency over the treaty bodies, Selini has uh, referred to it. We are endeavoring not to work in silos. And just as we speak now, we are having a back-to-back -back with the uh, CRC, the CEDAW committee and the CRC are having a back-to-back -back, um, dialogue. And so between us, we have, rec we have identified common themes. Uh, this happened over, was it Wednesday, Thursday, just this week. And so we have <coughs> collaborated, we've come together and have asked what is common among these two um, committees. We have identified some points, uh, gender stereotypes, health, uh, about five areas of commonality. And one proposal, uh, we will finalize it when we adopt the concluding observations is that for those concluding observations, we will also be referencing the two committees. Mm. Yes. The innovation. It's innovation. <laughs> so there is consistency vertically, that is, and horizontal. Yes. So this is what I would, I would say. Uh, I think um, Hilary has to a large extent said exactly what I was going to say. And I, I, I think that probably uh, reflects uh, the fact that uh, there's no 
uh, inconsistency as such in the sense of uh, contradiction. Mm -hmm. But there is an evolution and a welcome one because uh, when I was in the committee, and I think it's probably this instead of other past members as well, uh, that nothing is cast in stone. The convention is cast in stone, but the interpretation and the evolution, which is the word you, you rightly used, is necessary because we have to evolve with contemporary trends and, uh, and findings. And so far as consistency with uh, what other treaty bodies do, this is something which I, I really welcome. When I was on the committee, I, I did a lot to try and uh, get the, especially Human Rights Committee and Committee of the Rights of a Child to be uh, uh, collaborating with us. And I'm very happy to hear about what's taking place this week. Uh, again, that shows innovation, as you said, uh, maybe not consistency with the way in which the committee has been working so far, but we, we have to keep moving, we have to keep improving, and I'm very happy to hear about that. So I, I would like to offer a slightly, um, perhaps more critical um, assessment of this um, uh, delicate question of um, consistency or inconsistency. As I said, I um, collected um, try to collect some hard data about um, in, in anal analyzing uh, the committee's concluding observations on Article 16. And I'll just offer one example of inconsistencies. Um, question of child marriages and forced marriages. By definition, every child marriage is forced marriage. But in 2014, for instance, 19 of the 23 concluding observations address child marriages, but only 10 of them addressed forced marriages. So that's a clear example of inconsistency. And there are more like that. And I think that uh, we all know the answer for that. Um, there is need for a more systematic um, methods of working, uh, more human power of staff and um, more, um, uh, I don't know how to say that. Um, there's a problem of staff moving mm -hmm. from one committee to another. We were very, very fortunate to have Cellini. CRC is now fortunate to have Cellini with the ability and the knowledge and the expertise and, and the, the, the institutional memory. Uh, but not all of the staff are like that, and not all of the members have the ability or the capacity or the time to, to, to check for um, precedence and for comparative, to do comparative work, whether internally in the committee, um, as you said, um, uh, well, um, vertically on the committee or horizontally with other treaty bodies. Um, this should be further developed to, to avoid such examples of uh, inconsistencies. I see there is a question in the room. Can you move? Yeah, I can wait. Okay. So, yeah. and, uh, Madeline Reese also as well. Um, mine's not a question, but because we're coming to the closing, um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. All of the uh, past, present members of the committee, because, you know, to be honest, we couldn't do any of this without you. Um, I think you, you need to know how much you're appreciated for everything you've done for furthering women's rights. And I just wanted to make that publicly known. So thank you. I, I, we still have two minutes. Andrew, you have asked for the floor. I want to give you the floor and I'll, I'll say a few closing yes. words after you. It, it, it's hard to follow up on that, and I, I don't want to be undiplomatic about variable quality of concluding observations. I agree with through It's part, partly its resources and, and support, uh, which isn't there. But one thing, I guess, uh, which I'm sure is important, and, and particularly as a user of concluding observations in various jurisdictions, the civil society input clearly has uh, an impact both on the range, the subjects, and the often often the depth and, and usability of, of the concluding observations. I, I mean, I, I assume that's uncontentious, but those who've served on the committee may have a may have a different view. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I would like to remark that thanks to what you told us, 
we can note that there are always new things going on in the world of uh, treaty bodies and human rights mechanisms. This is uh, good. I think it's a really very important development. Um, we're not sure where the treaty body strengthening process will land. Um, I'm sure of one thing is that there needs more resources, that is more people to do the work, but there also needs more collaboration between the people who do the work, whether they are very few or whether they are more, they are more numerous, but when they are very few, they just don't have time to talk together, <laughs> which is a big, one of the big problems. But um, I hope that this, uh, this discussion brought you, as I said in the beginning, in a nutshell, the content of what we tried. You have leaflets before you uh, from the publisher, Oxford University Press. I would advise you, I would ask you to, um, or recommend rather, um, to take advantage of the 30% promotion price that uh, <laughs> Oxford University Press is still presently doing. And I would like to thank all of you for coming here in this room. I would like to thank all the people who have followed us online. I belatedly thank the Federal Department for Foreign Affairs, which contributed to the cost, partial cost of this event. And I thank you, uh, Gloria, Professor Gagioli, and the Geneva Academy, Roma, for the organization of uh, this event. It has been for us a great chance to partner with the Geneva Academy for the launch of uh, our commentary. Thanks a lot to you. Yes, yeah, so I do. And you want to have a picture? Participants, would you please come behind us? We'll continue sitting here. Gloria, you may want to come and sit with us, and um, so that we have a picture. With, uh, and stay on, please, uh, so that we have people here. Okay. I don't know what that does to the right to image, but uh, I'm not going to care for now. Those who are going to come to us, do come one day. No, it's taking pictures nearer, nearer, and nearer. <laughs> Sorry. It's quiet when taking pictures. <laughs> Okay. Then, then, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And do the bye to Can you wait a few minutes? Oh, wow. Well, sure. Ah, okay. Yes. Very nice to see you. I'm in the distance. I I see you arriving. So what is the shape? Oh, I think that's my. Thank you.